Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the seventh Roto Grinders So Rare podcast. I am your host, as always, Sean PSU fans to Newsham. Joining me, a special guest, the second member of the So Rare Andrews. You guys met the first one a couple weeks ago in Andy Black. We have Andrew Laird, also known as Lairdino, on So Rare. Andy, how is it going? Or Andrew, I guess you're Andrew, he's Andy. It's confusing. No, everything is going well. It's funny you say that. Like it took us, it took me way too long to find out that Black's name was Andy. And it's like one of those things that like you just happen to know people by, you know, like by DFS handles. I assume many more people know you as PSU or PSU fans than they do Sean. And so finally he was like, oh, by the way, my name is also Andrew. And I was like, whoa, how about that? <laughs> yeah, but it's just, you never end up knowing this stuff. We were just talking before we came on air about how uh, we have no life and we just are so rare all the time. So if you are someone new and you're just coming in today for the first time, uh, make sure you check the link in the description. You get a free limited card for after you buy five cards at the auction house. So it's a great way to get started. Uh, speaking of which, Andrew, you're the person that brought me on to the platform. And I'm sure you have good stories of people that you brought onto the platform getting good reward cards, don't you? I do. And it's nice of you to bring it up since I believe you have the best reward that anybody that I've uh, I've referred to, though. But I, I'll be honest, I did get a couple of good rewards down the line. So it's it certainly I mean, the uh, they've kind of changed a little bit, but those those rewards can absolutely be very helpful. Yeah. And so we're allude, uh, what we're alluding to is I got a Rand Cherokee who uh, we can see what he's worth now. I don't check him every day. I used to check him every day. He used to be like one of my very valuable cards. Uh, which has sort of changed a little bit over time. But yeah, so you see, he's worth about 0.8 Ether. I got a rare. So things have changed a little bit to where now you get a limited card instead of a rare card. But there's plenty of rare or limited cards out there that are valuable. So I know, Laird, that the other day you guys had your So Rare's Andrews podcast, and you guys talked about your limited cards. So what have you been doing with the limited cards thus far? I have bought already so many more than I expected to. And it's not maybe I expected to buy this many, but I just didn't expect it to do to be so quickly. But the way that I've looked at it, and I've seen a lot of opinions on like what the point of limited cards are and, and who should be buying them. And, and clearly the, the goal was to make it cheaper for new players to come in because the kind of the starting price when you were just dealing with rares was pretty high. And so the idea was if they have this new scarcity, then the, the entry point gets a little cheaper. But it also kind of allowed people like me to buy cards that of players whose rare cards I was never going to be able to afford. And so I kind of started doing that of just uh, I made I made some stacks of, like I said, teams that of players that I would never be able to buy, or at least I haven't, you know, it would, wouldn't make sense to spend so much money on these specific cards uh, if they were rares or super rares. And so it kind of gives me the ability to to cheer for some more fun players. I see a card that you have here that uh, I wonder who you would have got the idea to get this card from right here. Uh, not only that, it's a Jersey Mint. If, oh, which, uh, right, it is. Yeah, which I I will be completely honest, I didn't realize until I had already won the card. I believe that. So I can tell looking through things, you probably got a Monero stack because they are a pain in the butt. Yes. Um, so that is probably why you bought them and you're used to losing to them repeatedly in America. So you wanted to make sure you got a piece of them. Um, so that's definitely interesting as well. And then I see that you got some other cards uh, like Cody Gakpo. So you're getting some like U23 PSV guys. I saw that you had two editions of Ibrahim Singare as well. Uh, someone that I really like and we talked about a bit last week. So yeah, I haven't dove in fully yet in terms of what I want to do with the limited edition cards. Um, I did, so I actually had a trade that I wanted to do. So you'll get a kick out of this. So one guy had a uh, Piotr Zelinski, which I've since sold on. I was doing it for a, a friend that was trying to get the card and just didn't have any cards to really dispose of. So what I did is I bought like the cheapest junk limited card for 0.01 ETH so that I could circumvent the low... Uh, offer price that the guy had set on Zelensky. So like the guy had set on Zelensky a min offer of like two ether, but 
but he had the card listed at like 1.8. And like the realistic price was like 1.4. Yeah. So I used the limited card that was worth 0 0.001 and said 1.4. And the guy actually snap accepted it. Wow. How about that? Yeah. So I thought that was a pretty funny uh, way that I used to circumvent things. But yeah, so for those of you that don't know, uh, Laird is the reason I'm on So Rare. So we've been acquaintances, I would say, for years now because uh, we're both heavily in the DFS soccer space. And I saw tweets that he posted about so rare and it was a thing so my busy time of the year is coming up uh generally like right now until january or so is when i'm just slam busy so i saw tweets around i would say october november that you posted about so rare and i was like oh that seems really interesting and i just did not have the time to research and look into it until february which has obviously cost me lots lots of money that would have not cost me have I had I got in first, but like what was how did you get on to so rare? Because I think were you the first person within the DFS space realistically to be involved in so rare? I'll take credit for it. Okay. So I'll say that. But basically it it actually came from one of our subscribers at Rotowire who was asking me for additional stats that I had never considered important before. Somebody was like, I was wondering if you know how many who the league leader in last man tackles was <laughs> and uh, who has the most penalty drawn, you know, penalties drawn and stuff like that. And I was like, why on earth do you want this? Because DraftKings and FanDuel don't care about this stuff. And he said, no, I'm playing this new game called So Rare. And I was like, all right, whatever. Like, to be honest, if, if you're around the DFS space enough, you know that there are just so many sites that pop up and, you know, with the most wild names you can come up with. And so I, be honest, didn't really give much thought to it, but at some point it was like, wait a minute, maybe so rare could buy some stuff from Rotowire. So we went, I could, we kind of reached out to them and said, you know, what can we do? And I had a call with somebody from so rare to like, explain it to me, explain the concept of so rare. And then I like, get, yeah, it's this fantasy soccer game with uh, these NFTs that you own and you have to buy them with Ethereum. And I remember leaving that call, like, this is the craziest idea I've ever heard. Like, I don't know why anybody would do this. And I, I, the more I kind of looked into it, it was like, all right, maybe this is something I don't know. Like the, the whole concept of NFTs was very strange to me. To this day, it's still a little strange, uh, but I've obviously jumped all in on so rare. But basically, I remember being at the gym once I was on a treadmill going through the, the uh, the auctions, and I think this must have been, I could probably look it up, but sometime January or February, maybe not even that late. And I saw this Jao Felix card, and I was like, huh, I think uh, I can buy this Jao Felix card and maybe sell it for like 50 bucks more than, than, I could, than I'm going to win this auction for. So I bid on the auction and won it and ended up not selling it for $50 more than I bought it. And you can see right there in my gallery, it's still there. But, uh, that kind of made me that threw me into the maybe this is this can be something and i subsequently started buying a few more oh that is a killer <laughs> so <laughs> if I clear like he could have sold it for not 50 bucks more than what he paid for it but like ten thousand dollars more than what he paid for it. and i can tell you the entire time this was going on so like I said, before So Rare, we were more acquaintances, whereas now we talk daily yeah. uh, and we're decent friends. Um, so I came on the platform around here. Right? Let's call it like early February, late January. So like it was just coming down. This whole time, he had the Joao Felix card. And let me just tell you, he was thinking about selling it over and over and over again. And like it, like it was a daily discussion of like, should I sell the Joao Felix? And I don't remember exactly how the conversation went, but it literally was a daily discussion of like, man, I feel like I should sell this right now. And it just never happened. And then obviously now you can't, when you decline selling it up here, you sure ain't selling it down here. <laughs> so, so until Joao Felix, if this ever happens, if Joao Felix never gets up here again, I don't think this card is ever leaving your gallery. Is that a correct assumption? I, I don't know how it leaves at this point, uh, yeah. unless it gets back up. And no, I, 
it, it was one of those you know, I think a lot of people who buy NFTs or, you know, buy stocks or other crypto and it's like, you know, you don't want to be the guy who bought Bitcoin at 100 and sold it at 500 and now it's at 40,000, you know, like so I kind of kept using this mentality, not that I thought it, they would always go up, but I just yeah, I didn't want to like miss out on additional upside. And it turns out that uh, I did, missed out on everything and now I still hold this card. And he's like arguably the worst player on the platform. No, and no, that's a four for the the for Chicago Fire. Shockingly, it's a Chicago Fire guy, but he is the worst player on the platform because he is a out and out striker, and his card is a defender card. Yeah, that might be. Yeah, like look at these score lines. Clearly, the worst player and the worst card on the platform. <laughs> I, I think the the benefit that he has though is that you know he's always going to not score well as opposed right. to you never know if he's going to score at all. Correct. So he, in turn well he also costs 0.01 ETH and not 0.6. So that right. that, that is viable. But yeah, so it's it's that's been a discussion we've had for for months and it's a long running joke uh between us in yes. terms of Joao Felix. But yeah, so uh, like I told people, like last week we had AJ on and he talked about things from Wales Gallery. We've had Alex on, who similar gallery to that of Laird. We've had Andy Black on, whose gallery is probably more similar to mine. I guess it's sort of in between yours and mine. Um, so we're just trying to cover every type of gallery. And we've also covered like, if you have one ether, like what you should do um as well so like we tried to hit every type of gallery that you might have and like what decisions you might go to but as someone who has a little bit of a smaller gallery and who i know hasn't put in tons of of uh resources into the platform um i just want to talk to you about that so you how much do you know how much about uh in terms of eth and then in terms of like fiat you've invested thus far on the platform i think I th whatever eth is now i think it's around like three eth yeah. So theoretically, it's worth, what does that say, just under 18. Okay. And I think what is important is that I haven't bought 18 ETH worth of cards. Like Correct. a lot of it are now rewards. And I think they're, you know, the value of whatever you put into this. Uh, so basically fiat wise, you know, ETH was different back then, but I think it's, you know, around 10 grand to be honest. Okay um dollars that is not euros or anything else but like uh so theoretically it's worth much more now and i've you know won these cards that if i wanted to sell I, there are a bunch of cards there that are easily sellable and so i've at least taken the the plan of reinvesting what i'm winning back into it i'll sell some cards that that i've won but uh, theoretically not that i'm playing with house money i haven't withdrawn the you know my initial three eth but the I know it's there. And so I'm actually just kind of re like I said, I'm reinvesting as much as I can to try to get my lineups that have won me rewards better so that I can win others. I actually should have talked to you when I won the Vandevort. If I offered you Vandevort rare for Alfonso Davies, would you have accepted it? The the problem is is that Davies is like the top of my U23 side. So I'd be yeah, okay. taking one U23 and replacing it so yeah and, and you're with your stacks it probably wouldn't have made sense i really wanted a davies the week i won the vandevort which to be honest like i sold the vandevort and i could have just bought davies effectively sure. um but i was just didn't do that uh but yeah so anyways so he put in around ten thousand dollars and the eth wasn't really what it is so like it's kind of irrelevant i guess from that perspective so like as you can see his gallery is now worth uh around 18 eth which is around fifty five thousand dollars usd so he's effectively like 5.5 x his uh, his entire gallery in about 10 months. And like he talked about, and this is where I think like people don't understand some things that you can do uh, in terms of winning rewards. So like he said, he has used, uh, he hasn't really withdrawn. Like I'm the same way. Like I've effectively not really, really withdrawn and I continuously improve my teams. Um, similarly to what Laird has done as well. And we'll talk about, sort of his progression and how much better he is effectively because of that and just because of different strategies he's used uh over the last six months which have really helped him but just looking here we're gonna just look at like the top three groups here so i know for a fact that this card was a reward 
I know that you told me earlier that you flipped a reward for the Ty Tyrell Malaysia. Yep. And I know that this card was also rewarded to Carlos Vela. Is any are any of these other cards rewards that you won? So the Gabriel Arias was a reward. Luis Diaz was a reward. Um, Hitano and Armani were referral rewards. Okay. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of hit or miss. And I think, yeah, I think that's it from that group. Yeah. So just looking at this top group, right? Carlos Gill was a reward. And to be fair, he, he ran very unlucky the week after that card was Neymar and not Carlos Gill, not salty or anything. I know. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. It was, it wasn't, uh, no, Neymar was the D3. Uh, the that the D four was Graven Birch. Not that I okay. hold that against anyone either, but yeah, okay. So again, like it's not he's not upset or anything, but like so. For example, this was a reward. This was a reward. This was a reward. This was a reward. This was effectively a reward. Yep, that's like one and a half ether he has just in straight rewards. You're close to two. It's close to two ether in straight rewards. Then. We talked about early using the link to sign up. If you get other people to sign up, you also get a free card when they win five at auction. So like you can come onto the platform and then give people your referral links and you can win cards that can be valuable. Granted, it has changed a bit, but he previously won cards that were very strong referral rewards. So of this, let's say this top end here, this top end echelon of his gallery, three to four either of these cards is just based on pure rewards. So that goes to show you like you don't have to have a 300 ether gallery to be able to win rewards that can be massive like the carlos gill like what else did you win too with gill you won probably close to an ethan was that part of the reward so uh the eth uh reward for the for gill was 0. 0.65 but i also won 0. 0.3 i think it was 0. 0.3 with vela yeah so that was almost another eth and that's like an actual eth not just in cards that i could then sell to turn into ETH. So, yeah. Correct. So, like, you, if, if everyone looks, like, he turned a gallery that a month or two ago was, like, let's say 15 ETH or 10, 12 ETH, and he's turned it into 18. So, yeah. it's just something to consider when you're going through things. And I'm going to show you his lineups for a given weekend and show you, like, what's changed in his lineups compared to what it was, let's say, four months ago. So let's look at what he did this weekend. I think you're having an okay week, but nothing special. Um, mm -hmm. But again, like this week he's having now where we're saying it's like nothing special. Three months ago, this would have been one of your best weeks, period, right? Yeah, probably. Uh, it's gotten to the point where like a week without winning a card becomes a disappointment where it used to be the goal of like, let me just win one and see what I can right. do. And um, that's just kind of what happens. Like, I was talking to somebody about this with like DFS. If you, you know, the bigger your bankroll becomes, the more you're able to to enter and then the more you're able to win. And it just kind of the the ROI kind of snowballs and, and so rare works very similarly that you're effectively putting more money in. Uh, you know, if you if you're able to reinvest your your cards, you know, you, you win a good card and then you play it in another in another uh, region or another tournament, and then you can win a card from that and it just, you know, you just keep going. And DFS is very similarly that if your bankroll is bigger, then you can enter more and you can, you know, presumably the, the raw dollar that you're winning each slate is higher because of what you've won previously. Exactly. And like, you just look at this team. I mean, I know your boy, Kim Min Tae finally paying off with the rewards he's bringing in right now. Um, so this team this is a terrible is, game week to look at. Ugh. Yeah. It's not a great game week to look at. We'll look back at the previous one too, but again, you're winning four cards. Yes. Some of them are limited, but you're getting four cards, you're hitting an ether threshold. That all adds up in the long run. Like you're still looking at 0 0.1, 0 0.2 ether probably over the long run, which is again, if you're making 0 0.1, 0 0.2 ether and your gallery costs you 20, you're making that up in close to a year in terms of ROI. Uh, and, and as you improve your team, you are going to win more cards that will again make you more ETH. And then you're going to reinvest that, win more cards that can win you more ETH, which again, that's a vicious cycle, but it is true. So like this team, for example, hit the threshold. This team is incredibly inexpensive. I'm sure you did not spend very much on any of these cards at all. Maybe maybe the Bore card you spent a bit on, but he, again, he's not very good and that's not right. a card that's doing much for you in this line. But so as you see here, he's able to put out full power lineups in most of the regions that he's playing. He right now is focusing on, as you see, D5, D4, D3 in most regions. 
and he's able to get out a reasonably decent powered uh, left foot, 12 to 13 lineups a week. So we'll look back two weekends ago where I think you had a pretty decent game week again. I think 190 was like my best one, I think. All right. So, yeah, so looking at 194, again, same thing. He has quite a few lineups that are pretty good. If Perea plays, which, again, he regresses. This was a mistake. He shouldn't have played Perea. This is a Tier 2 card at least, if not a Tier 0, which is very valuable. Got a card and a threshold here. Got a card here somehow, even with a zero. That was the first week. Yeah, that's why. That's why no one was really playing at that time. Yeah. Got a card here, Tier 2, not even a Tier 3, which are valuable. Got a Tier 1 in America, which, again, like, so all of these add up. Like, so this game week probably, did you look and be like, oh, this probably netted me like 0.25 ETH, give or take? Yeah, that sounds about right, if not a little more even. That yeah. So, like, you're looking at 0.25, 0.3 ETH, let's call it. Again, on his current ratio where it's at it's not going to take him forever to recoup his investment um and he can keep reinvesting so we'll look at 190 which is which was a big game week for him and obviously as you see he won america d3 got the vela so we're going to look at these cards none of these cards were very expensive at all and if i remember correctly i think i talked about this one with alex on one of our shows you paid for this entire team effectively on this game week almost um yeah. yep. so this goes to show people like it's doable even on smaller budgets and it's not just division three because i think the week before you probably was the week you won a global award that one was uh 180 i actually have it here 186 186 so we're gonna look back here so that week he won america d3 again his team was not super expensive got the job done this week he won global D4. This is about one of the cheapest starting goalies you can get. Angelari, I don't think his rare card is that expensive. No. Nope. Mensa, I know, was 0.03 Ether at one point. Reynoso is a little more expensive, but nothing outrageous for what he produces. And then Shabilko is pretty solid as well. So all of a sudden, this team turned into Carlos Gill, which, as you saw, is worth like 0.6 today, and it was worth more before he got injured, and 0.65 Ether. This team as a whole probably cost you around 0.5 or so, 0.6 ether. It was even better because Mensa, I had won previously. There you go. And Mensa was a reward that came in and he won and puts up 100 points. So, uh, there, excuse me, so, the Shabilko was also a reward. There you go. Two rewards in here. So, he went and used cards that he previously won yeah. and parlayed them into winning a division for 1.3 ETH. And it could have been all the way up to like three and a half, four ETH if he got a good reward and got lucky and got like a Neymar or a Lewandowski type of card. So it's, it's stuff like this that can really advance you and help you go through things. So I know that you have been uh, looking at super rares more recently uh, within your gallery. And that's like been a priority to start adding them so that you can make the progression to D3. And you and I talk about it pretty frequently with like, Hey, what, and you asked me like what my thoughts are on a certain super or what price would make sense for him. Why don't you talk to everybody about like what you've been going through in terms of super rares and how you're looking at moving up and like what type of players you're looking for. Yeah. So I think the most important thing when you're looking to make any sort of progression in so rare is to see where, like what you're best at now. And it's like, instead of, saying I'm going to buy a super rare and then just kind of figure out where I can play it. Like the super rare should make sense. And so the, the first one I bought, I'll admit was just a, I think this guy is struggling and, and underpriced, but everything else, it's like, if I bought a defender, it's because I had the goalie or I went the other way. I, uh, I had, or it was a, a guy who I liked who I had the rare and I thought, Oh, I can, I'll get the super rare of him and then I can pair a goalie, but like everything that, you do on so rare should be about lineups and not cards. And that was something that took me a while to get to. And Sean, I'll give you certainly credit for that, that the, there was just a, I think there's a big mentality in so rare, like, Oh, let me get a bunch of cards and I can put them together and blah, blah. blah. And it, it was even before you started, or at least before you started building your collection was these are the guys that I think I should have in lineups. And so let me just build lineups from there. And it's, it's a very clear DFS mentality of, you know, 
that's all we do in DFS. We make lineups. And so this is all about if I make this lineup, how well will I do? And so how much does this lineup cost? Or can I make a comparable lineup, but co that costs less? And that's kind of what I think everybody should do when they start to progress. If you're only buying limited cards right now, and at some point you want to go to rares, you got to say, what is the, what do I want to end up with when I start buying cards? And you, and you don't want to start buying cards and then figure out where you're going to go. And so the super rares, you just, yeah, need to focus on, on where you might have some, some, you know, where your lineups might be struggling or where you'd be able to find like a guy who's comparable talent or, you know, score wise from a rare that you have, but you can do, do a cheaper super rare. And now you're like progressing to the next division. And it's just, it's, it's all about figuring out where they fit within your lineups as opposed to just like, let me go buy some super rares. Definitely. And I know that you have not spent much on these super rares. Like you're looking at these cards and I think the only one you paid what we'll call like a somewhat significant amount for is Dahomey. All the other cards you probably paid like 0.2 or less on. Is that correct? Or less, yeah. Yeah. So like he has, again, he has nine super rares right now. And the only one that he paid up for was Dahomey. Yeah. All the other ones he paid a significantly reduced price. And again, like these are all unheralded people. He bought Rusnak at around 0.185. That might actually be what you paid for him. And yeah, we look at what, yeah, you paid 0.185. And we look at what Rusnak has done for you since then. And he's just absolutely smashed. Because yeah. I think you bought him right around here in 168, 170. And since then, he's absolutely blown it out of the water. So again, this card, I think we saw a recent auction of this card um, went for 0.4. Oh, that was a while ago. Let me check the recent offers. I know one sold recently that was a bit higher. So yeah, we've seen a 0.758 sell since you bought it for 0.185. So effectively, that card's gone up 4x and you've won tons of rewards because of that card. So it's things like this that are really beneficial and impactful for galleries that can really help you move up. So all of a sudden, you look through his gallery and you see he has four defenders, three midfielders, and two forwards. Well, all of a sudden, he's getting closer and probably playing in D2s. I'm assuming that you're probably playing America D2 some weeks with your team. And the idea is, is now you're not far off from doing that in general. That was D2 was definitely the plan uh, once I started expanding. And one of those defenders was a, I won that card from this, from a special week. Yeah. That Jonathan Diaz. I, I have no idea who he is. And if anybody wants to buy it, I'm happy to sell it. But uh, yeah, like the, the Rusnak one to go back to that, like looking back at like what I've won from that, like I won the Shabilko card that I then used in global all-star to win. That was a Rusnak lineup. I won a Georgie Mihalovic rare, Gabriel Arias, Guillerme. He was in the Vela one that, that helped me win Vela. Yep. And then this Juan Romero dud that I won a few weeks or last week. Yeah, that was unlucky as well. <sighs> but yeah, like just what you just talked about, right? That's a one and a half ether worth of cards. Yeah. So if you divide it by five, he's paid himself all off plus some already, and you've had the card for two months. So it's stuff like that that you can do to really improve and start implementing progression for yourself so as you guys see he's really only focused on america right now that's where his super rares are focused i'm assuming you're going to transition to maybe get um some cheaper rare or super rares in challenger just so that you have them is that something that you're probably going to do yeah that's absolutely the plan and and it's really instead of saying here's the universe of of super rares that are available in challenger it's like all right what what players do I have? Could I get a super rare defender of the goalkeeper that I have? And just trying to make sure that whatever super rare that I buy at this point makes sense with the lineup that I'm going to play. Because, I mean, you can play so rare by to buy cards and sell them at a profit and you can just grind out, you know, small profits each time. But like I, I basically buy cards or trade cards in order to, to make my lineups better. So if I can't necessarily, you know, if somebody's offering me something and it's a player that I, I would just have to sell to find the value. Correct. And I'm not going to play it in a lineup. And an I example just, of something he might do to improve his team, right? He has an Adon rare. He might try to bring in like a coach rare or super rare to pair with this card in division three would probably be a plan 
that I'm sure you've considered and you probably decided Coates was too much. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, the uh, the sporting guys are definitely expensive, but like, but that's absolutely the strategy. Is like, I you know, I goalkeepers are the more expensive guys, and I have a few of them. So now it's like that Tyler Miller card. Like I have a Debassy super rare, and so I play them together pretty much every game week, and you just hope for a Minnesota United clean sheet. But yeah, this. Any defender super rare that I buy from now on will likely be on a team of one of the guys on that on that page. Correct. Because it just exactly. doesn't make too much sense to to pair them together. And for example, I, I'm assuming this is something you would do. Let's hypothetically say you get a a uh, CSK Moscow defender super rare. You might trade this or sell it so that you can get the CSK Moscow goalkeeper. Is that correct? I'd certainly consider it. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it again. It's all about making lineups better, and so the the goalie defender correlation is just too. It makes too much sense. And if if you can get, I, mean, I think super rare goalies are out of my uh, price range. And frankly, I, they they don't usually have enough upside for them anyway. But if I could get the if I have a goalie and I can get the super rare defender, then I'm I'm absolutely going to do that. Exactly. And so this is just a player to like use as an example because I know. Alex has this person. It's something we've talked about recently with Alex. So he bought a Jonathan Harris super rare. And as you see, his last five is 70. Yeah, that's awesome. He paid 0.142 for this. So I know Alex isn't here today, but I know of his result this week. So we're going to go check out what Alex did this week with his team. And we're going to show you guys like how not expensive it is um, to to get this. Like, yes, it's it's not going to be like – Point one ETH to get this type of stuff, but he's also not spending like 10 ETH like some people are running him out in D2. So Challenger D2, you see he's in seventh. Right now, that is a tier two super rare, which we will go look at in a second as well. And he just missed a tier one. He has Guillaume Hubert. So we will click on all these, these cards here. So he has a Guillaume Hubert rare. He paid 0.274 for this card. Uh, it's probably one of the cheaper challenger goalies you can get. And he on a, he does not have this team stacked because he just does not have a defender from Ustende. Um, in my opinion, he should look at like getting Jack Hendry, um, but he just has not done that yet. So 0.27 Ether. He got a Jonathan Harris. We just talked about this card. This guy has an L5 of 70, and he paid 0.129 Ether for that. It's a great that, find. It's really good. I'm not to say he's going to, to continue this forever, but you get a guy at 0.129 Ether that puts up an L5 of 70 for five games. That pretty much pays off the entire card in general. Yeah. Um, you just hope you hit one of those weeks, but that's all you want. We move on to the Matt Sunchez. He paid this card 0.241 Ether. Okay. Steph Peters, I know he bought this last year. He bought this like during the boom, and it was 0.42 Ether. And Peters has gone up substantially because he's been really good. And then he bought Emil Hansen for 0.196. So we go back to his lineup. He is playing the entire lineup at a significant disadvantage from what everyone else is. He does not have a unique. He does not have five super rares. He has the bare minimum you can have. And Hansen did not do anything. Harris did not have a score point. Despite, despite having 98.6, that is not including a decisive. Um, wow. Similar, Hubert conceded twice, still put up almost 60. So <laughs> these guys are putting up uh, good, good stats despite being super cheap. So we look at that. Now we're going to go look at what a Tier 2 Super Rare is. Again, this is just a Tier 2. This is not a Tier 1. Um, the tier ones are great. I've looked through them. They're really strong. So if we assume that he's getting the second of like 13 super rares in tier two, I personally go through this and I'll look through it myself. Like if I'm winning a star rare and I'm like one, uh, if I'm like three of 28, I'm pretty confident mine's going to be in the top like 10% and look sure. at what the cards are. So do you do that as well? I look at tiers a little too much. But I just look at the bottom, really, because that's where I expect to. You know, you, if you prepare yourself for the worst, then you get excited when it, you don't necessarily get it. Although you get the worst a lot, so I get the worst a lot. It's not fun. I, <laughs> I, I, I need to stop getting like thirty-eight-year-old goalies in tier zero. Like, if I keep getting those, I'm just gonna be sad. I just can't get them. So, anyways, we're gonna look. So, as you see, he's seventh. 
So he's the second of, let's call it 13 super rares or so. Well, if you look, I would say there's probably, let's say, 50 or so cards here. So I'm going to say he likely will get a card in the top 10 mm -hmm. of the game week. So let, let's look at the top 10. Van Hamel, he's pretty terrible. But again, like Alex went in with a rare goalie. Getting mm -hmm. a super rare goalie, even though he's not the best, like we'll look at Van Hamel and we'll look at these guys on so rare data as well. Like again, hey, if he gets 46, that's playable. So what do you think about like a card like that? Yeah, no, I mean, it's one of those that, and, and the, his lineup is just kind of showing it that you don't have to have like all superstars to win on a given game week. And obviously having like superstar lineups helps on a more consistent basis, but that tier two, I mean, excuse me. Yeah. That tier two super rare is like a great card to have. And so, yeah, you'd rather play five super rares in a lineup. And if he won that one, then, you know, his lineup gets better for next week. Exactly. So anyways, Van Hamel, not the best. And, and again, like every tier, as everyone knows, the tiers aren't the best right now. I know that's something they're working on, hopefully improve soon, but like Sangari is a two ether card. Uh, or pretty close, like I yeah. used very close. I'm sure Wober, let's check out. So we're going to check out these cards. So Van Hamel. So Van Hamel is, let's call it 0.6 Ether. Sangar I know is two. We will look up Wober, who I think is probably around one, probably around one, give or take. Um, Brandon Michelle is like a one Ether card. Philip Max is solid, another goalie. Yari is a one and a half ether card uh caduce would kind of be a major dud because for alex like this card could be super viable now yeah. that said caduce like apparently you can sell caduce for a decent chunk um which i mean it just he doesn't will. benefit him because he's not going to do anything for him right now right um but like and then like openda chiokavin and hayden like these are all like most all of these cards are one ether ish cards that are super viable like let's remove uh like someone terrible in his lineup from this week and all of a sudden replace him with ibrahim sangara week to week well that's gonna help him win, win more of these rewards going forward so like that's the hope is that you can win cards like this like and even if you go a little bit further you like you see aaron zahab you see theodore smolov you see rave Lowe, you see these cards that are really really strong cards that he has a chance of winning by putting the bare minimum cards that were super cheap together in tier in division two but also what we talk about and i'm sure you are working your way towards this is that when you build d2 or when you build division four strongly it therefore helps your division three when you build division three strongly it therefore helps your division two. And it works the other way around too. When you build your division two strongly, it helps your division three and flies and keeps going on the way down. And the, the reason this is, is because let's say you end up with a better super rare. So like, let's say Alex wins Ibrahim Sangare this week, right? All of a sudden next week, Matt Suchins, who averages, let's say around uh, an L40 of 47. Well, let's say he wins Sangare. Sangare is an L40 of like 57. Yeah. He just improved his team by like 12 points. And then also, he then goes down to his Challenger Europe Division Three team. And let's, let's say Mies Hodemacher's is worth 43 points a week. Well, now all of a sudden he gets replaced by Sunjins and Hodemakers is out. And that improves your team by four points. And then... Hoda Bakers, as you see, is 23. All of a sudden, you go down to the bottom. Alex doesn't even have a U23 team. Maybe that moves him into U23, or if nothing else, it provides cover for him if someone else gets injured. So the ability to um, make your players better and stronger is crucial. So what do you think in regards to that aspect of like your team? So for example, we'll talk about um, I know these guys are injured right now, but you won Vela and you won Gil. Gil in the last month. Let's pretend they were healthy. 
Well, all of a sudden you prioritize, let's say Vela and Gil. Let's just pretend you use them in America because it'll be easier, right? That, yeah, that's exactly where I'd put them. Yeah, all of a sudden your Mauricio Perea becomes Carlos Gill, your Lucas Zalarian or your John Tolkien becomes Mauricio Perea. And then also like maybe, all right, maybe you're happy with Gustavo Bo, right? Well, you look up here and you see Rafael Bore. Well, maybe this becomes Gustavo Bo, this becomes Carlos Vela. And all of a sudden you've not only improved your division four in America, your division three in America, you've also gone ahead and improved your division four overall. It's just, it's a, it's a sort of domino effect where like you bring in one player who's better than someone else. It pushes that person down to the next level, which then pushes that person down to the next level. Eventually, yes, you end up having guys that are on the bench that you previously started, but you and I can both tell people that like having good substitutes and usable players off the bench that you can sort of play matchups for or like midweeks type stuff. The more guys you have that can fill in in those situations are crucial to success. Yeah, for sure. Like um, if you go back to that game week 190 with the one where I won Vela, that's kind of the the lineup that I used there with it in Champion America Division Three. That's the lineup I pretty much use as much as I can in in those types of in in that region. But instead of Reynoso and Boo, then I'm going to have Vela and Gill, and so and then I can use Boo and Reynoso in other lineups. Like it just, you're right. The domino of like you can just move guys from one lineup to another makes makes total sense. Yeah. So it's something that like again, you'll notice this stuff as you guys grow your galleries, um, and it doesn't matter where. Like if for me, I can tell, I can literally show you stuff that I do that improves my gallery that will push things down for me. Uh, so for example, um, like I buy some of these cards, like I recently won Yamaguchi. So Yamaguchi probably bumps someone out of all-star division. Actually funny story about this. I've won four of these cards. That's these awesome. Four, these four cards were all one uh, rewards. So that's something to think about. So anyways, like, yeah, like if I look through my teams, like if I have um, Hassani Dotson here, right? So for example, he replaces Christian Espinosa, who's injured and did not play this week. Well, all of a sudden Christian Espinosa then comes here and replaces Pedro Santos. And so all of a sudden I've upgraded here. Then I come down here and Santos goes in over Albert Rusnak. And then I don't have to play Hollingshead and I can play a better rare defender. And then therefore, like I've improved like six lineups. Yeah. So small things like that can like literally one player can improve five lineups and people don't understand that at all. No, <clears throat> I think that the trickle down is, is definitely real. And I mean, we're, we're not here to say like, it's easy to do all of this, but at some point you'll be able to make lineups that effectively have cost you nothing because you could make one with five rewards. And so uh, you get to that point, like, yeah, you get to that point and you know, that's like the definition of free rolling. And, you right. know, like you're just winning lineups, you're winning additional cards from cards that you never paid for. And that's kind of the goal of all of us from Sora. Yeah, hundred percent. And like I said, like, I know for a fact that these four cards are one rewards. So I got the, the four bet, three bet cards in this lineup were all rewards that I won. And they weren't even high end. Like I'm pretty sure Terame was a tier two when I won them. I think that this, I don't think any of them were tier zeros except for Pedro Gonzalez. These were like tier one or tier two cards. Um, Azraoui, Yamaguchi and Terame were not tier zero cards when I won them. So like it goes to show like tier one, tier two rewards can be crucial. Um, yes, tier threes are generally not great. You generally want to get tier twos. I know personally, I only really care if I get tier ones or tier zeros at this point. You probably care if you get tier twos as well, I would assume. Yeah, for sure. But like, you know, even if it's not somebody I'm going to use in my lineup, like you, you can sell that card and you can buy something that you are going to use. So, you know, every day you, you kind of have said this a while, like you don't care what you win. And obviously you care a little bit, but like, as long as you're winning cards, that's good because you can either use them 
or try to sell them and that helps you but get other cards that you want and so winning cards is always good definitely and then and, and he is right like any card is is viable and can be sold uh and it doesn't matter necessarily how bad a card is like yeah you might not get much let's say you win 10 tier threes that are worth 0.01 ether and all of a sudden you have 0.1 ether that could buy you a card that's usable like for example i know rusnak i have an alba rusnak like his rare is probably worth 0.1 maybe it's worth a little bit more let's see i clicked on the wrong button let's see how much the rusnak is worth yeah so all of a sudden you get 10 tier three rewards yes that might take you a few weeks but let's say over a month you win 10 tier threes to go for 0.01 well you just got yourself an albert rusnak so you need to look at it like that like set yourself a goal of like hey i really want this card and set up your rewards to be a way of getting that card have you done that where like you have a player you really want um i don't know who it would be but where you're like i really want this card and you start setting up like a fund where you're like, all right, I'm going to sell this reward for 0.01 ETH. I'm going to sell this card for 0.03 ETH. And eventually you will have enough to buy that card that you've been coveting. It, have you done that at all? I have not, but I, I, A, I probably should. And B, I, I definitely know people who, who have done that. And it's, I mean, it's a very simple accounting way too. Of just like, even if you are, are not necessarily winning cards, but if you're just buying, you know, if you buy a card for point. 003 and you sell it for 0.007 and like each little profit like gets you at there like we talk about a lot about lineups but there are plenty of people who play so rare just to get profit on buying and selling cards and like there's nothing wrong with doing that like it's it's a way that you can do it it's basically a more popular like nft strategy of people like buying you know board apes or whatever the the new one is now you know you buy it for one eth and you sell it for two eth or whatever it is and the numbers may be smaller for the for these cards, but generally like, yeah, that's the point. And so I know someone who bought 10 cards and he's like, I just want to make 0.005 on each, but I know that when I get, when I profit on each one of them, that's going to be, allow me to afford something else. And so you just go from there. And yeah, I think that's a very popular strategy. And yeah, it's probably another one that I'll take from you that I should probably do myself. No, I mean, I, I do it sometimes. I know I have players like it took me, but again, so the, the problem with this, and I will admit sometimes it takes me way too long to buy a player that would really benefit me. Um, it took me, I tried to get Noah Lang for man, four months. I just kept trying to buy Noah Lang and just never worked out. I would always come up just short of negotiations and it cost me a lot of rewards. Uh, and I can I know another one, and this guy is not pretty. Um, it's Jung Sung Rong from uh, Kawasaki Front Tail. The, the reason I wanted him is because I have a full Front Tail stack, and they yeah. play so many weird slates that I felt just having him and being able to run a full five man was incredibly valuable. Um, not even just D4, like I had a D, at the time, I had Tanaka super rare and Demeo super rare. So like I had a D3 stack that would be like him, Yamane, Matoma, Tanaka, Demeo. Like the best line you can possibly run. But it took yeah. me so long to get this card. Like I would say I wanted this card. And again, the reason it took me so long is because I refused to overpay. But I think if I overpaid, let's say 0.4 E, if I would have overpaid from what I eventually got at, like I got it at point three or something eventually well let's say i paid 0.4 and overpaid for it two months prior it would have paid itself off yeah um i just am stubborn and don't like to, to overpay on stuff but like let's see what he he's gonna get me a fourth place in d1 this week so since he's been on my team which as you see was like around 183 he's got me a podium in asia d3 and he's got me four other rewards and then also a fourth place gas uh, prize this week. So like you see, like I've made, uh, let's call it 0.7 plus this game week will probably be like close to an ether, I would guess. So he made he's made me one and a half ether in like freaking a month. So me not getting this card like two months prior probably has cost me a significant amount. Um and, and it's stuff like that that is definitely frustrating. Noah Lang is the same way. And I know for a fact, I tried to buy Noah Lang for literally, it feels like my entire life. And I finally just said, I'm going to buy it. I don't care. Um, and paid 0.8. And if you look, 
I've had him for like three game weeks. This is the first one. He's not winning me a reward, and he won me U23 D3. And with the Kettleair, I would have been printing with this card for a while. So it just it's stuff like that that I look back and I'm like, man, sometimes overpaying is worthwhile. So Noah Lang is like one of those cards that I have long been like, I just should get one. Like it's really expensive, but it just takes your lineup to a whole nother level. And I had sold a few cards and saw that exact Noah Lang on the market. I think it was on for like 0.85 or something like that. And I thought to myself, I bet I can get it for 0.8. And I think I had to like sell one more thing to get the, my ETH balance high enough to like where I was comfortable getting rid of that much ETH and then having some left over. And I remember I finally did it and I went to buy it and it was like, oh, Sean owns that card now. At least I was right on the point eight though. You, you were, I, I, I'm i going to be honest. So I tried for, like I said, four months and it finally happened. And it was still a point where like I wanted to pay 0.75 and like we got to point eight. I'm like, I need to just overpay because otherwise I'm not going to get it. And I knew I had the kettle air. I know I have a stacked, um, back end with like Yuya Oki and Machida. And I knew that I have like Pedro Gonzalez. I'm like, I, I have to buy this card. It just is yeah. too much. Now that said, like, I think if you have a reasonably strong division three or division two U23 team come this weekend and Lang does not transfer, I think you are foolish. This goes for anyone. I think you're foolish not to own a Noah Lang because he just is that much of a cheat code in that division that like you just recoup but like it's like i tried to buy romu lukaku for literally you and you knew this literally a month i tried to yeah. get lukaku and i just never got to the card now that said like that one i i'm okay with because if he's not on inter milan i don't really care right now for him um that said like i'm sure we can look to see what so the price i was trying to pay was one point one or 1 1.2 and i never got anyone below 1.35 um and let's see what his value is worth now like now as you see he's selling he's legit selling at like 1.6 um so i could have made a little bit there but again like i don't care as much because he's not on inter milan but like i tried to get this card for at least a month and just came up short over and over again and it would be to the point where like i think looking back had he stayed at inner and just tore it up this season with my inner stack and I did not have him, I will would be feeling really stupid. So I think that's something I need to take uh, myself is that sometimes overpaying is worthwhile. It's the same thing with auctions. Like uh, I know you, you don't care about numbers at all. You don't care about like the one of tens, right? I don't. Yeah. So like, I don't either. I know some people care about one of tens, one of 100s, uh, Jersey numbers, et cetera. Um, I know you and I really don't like, yes, like I value it. If I'm going to sell it to you, I'm going to value, but I, I was going to say that we value it because we know that other people might value right. it. But like, like I said, I, I didn't buy that Madron 10, you know, Jersey number 10 because I valued it. And actually the first limited card I ever acquired was in a trade. I traded a Zach McMath rare for a Camilo, uh, Camilo Vargas limited. That was one of a thousand. Yep. And just, uh, yeah. but okay. we also do acknowledge that some people do care so like, and yeah. i'm not saying it's right or wrong like either way it could be right but like i'm not going to go and overpay for a jersey number or right. one and or like for example like people wanted more for the or the belgian lukaku than the milan lukaku i was i don't care i just wanted a lukaku um but when auctions start generally the first auction is the most expensive then it tails off but, and I've noticed this myself, when it comes to super rares, there's not going to be very many auctions during the course of the year. So, for example, a card I was looking at today was Cody Gakpo. I didn't get it. Um, but it went for three Ether. So, like, hypothetically, let's say the next Cody Gakpo goes for 2.5 Ether. Well, that auction might not be till November. Right. So, if that auction's in November... Would I have been better off spending three ether today than spending 2.5 ether in November? Probably not. Like I probably would have been better off overpaying for it today than overpaying or than paying for it at a lower price point later. Um, so that's something that I know personally I need to 
I need to start being more okay with like, if there's a player and I have become this a little bit with some players, if there's a card that I need and I need to go get it, I am going to go get it generally. Um, even if I have to overpay a little bit, but I, I know for me, that's difficult because it's difficult for me to take what I deem as a loss on a trade, but it's something I'm going to be doing in the future. Yeah. I think it's just as simple as having to build in the cost of what you could have won had you had the card immediately or if like you're going to wait for the next Gakpo auction and like we have no idea when it is Correct. and theoretically you could win one that that's also a possibility but you just never know when that happens and so if the next one doesn't happen for another three months what would you have won what are you going to win over the next three months with that Gakpo super rare? and so yeah you, you absolutely have to uh, consider that I'll I'll bring up that Rusnak super rare that I bought was one of ten and uh, it was another one that I didn't even realize was one of 10 until after I owned it. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's a great question. So like, for example, like my goal is to win cards and win like cards that like I would care about like that. And I'm going to look, I'm going to show you guys the U23 challenger pool. I expect at some point during the, the season, I'm going to win three or four like tier one super rares in challenger because my team's good enough, especially if on a watch, you doesn't transfer. My team's definitely good enough. Well, if I'm looking down this list, I'm going to see that there are cards that are very similar to Gakpo. I don't know if he's on this list uh, himself. He's not here, but like Mike Trezor is a card I like a lot. I just, I'm worried that if no one transfers out, he gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. Um, but I expect to be getting cards like this at least every so often. So all of a sudden, like if I can win a Medi Terame card, well, that's huge for me. And if I own, already own one, like then I got to sell it at a discount. But yeah, like really there's a, there's an opportunity cost in waiting to buy cards. On the flip side, that three ETH that I didn't spend on Gakpo today, I can invest on other cards as well. Sure. So it, it's a double-edged sword. But anyways, we'll wrap it up for today. This has uh, been around an hour or so. So that's probably about as long as you guys want to listen to us talk uh, today. Laird is going to be back with us next week for a couple episodes. I have a special guest lined up for Wednesday. I'm not going to reveal who it is yet in case something falls through with them. Um, so we will wait and see on that one. But Laird knows who it might be, and he thinks it's a good one, don't you? That should be a, a very, very good conversation for yeah. a number of reasons. So assuming that it doesn't fall through, make sure you guys tune in to the uh, show later in the week. And then Laird will be back next week for a couple shows. And then that will be 10 for us, which right now is our plan to end after 10. If everyone is interested in more, make sure you let so rare and Roto grinders know uh, it could be something we continue going forward. Um, and it looks like I just got an offer here. Let's see how this offer is right now. Um, it looks like a couple that I will not be really considering. Let's, I don't, I'm not familiar with this guy. Okay, he's not scoring terrible. I'll have to take a look at that off screen. But anyways, Larry, is there anything else you want to talk about before we wrap up today? No, I'd say just uh, if anybody has any questions you want us to tackle next week, feel free to reach out to us. Definitely. And you can reach Andrew at Lairdino on Twitter, I believe. Uh, at Rotowire Andrew. Uh, at Rotowire Andrew on Twitter. On Discord, he is Lairdino. On Sower, yeah. he is Lairdino. Yes. Uh, you can reach out to me at PSUFans2 at on the Twitter and I'm the same pretty much everywhere, honestly. Um, so that will wrap it up for us today. Uh, good luck to everyone during the international break. I know as of right now, we're not as excited as we want to be about it, but hopefully that change is going forward. Uh, so for Andrew, I am Sean. Make sure if you are new, you check the link in the description. We will see you guys next week. Have a good one.